Oh, wow. It even worked. Uh, I'm Francesco Spagnolo, curator of the Magnus. It's wonderful to have everyone here for a program that is co-sponsored by the Toby Foundation for Jewish Life and Culture, the Berkeley Center for Jewish Studies, the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life, and the Graduate Theological Union. Um, it's the, the topic tonight and the presenter are particularly apt since we had in this room uh, earlier this week. It's a busy week and next week too, but we had the Council of American Jewish Museums and I, I think on Sunday when I was at the Contemporary Jewish Museum, uh, Barbara kirschenbach Gimblet was on two screens projected into the room and we all learned about, uh, about the museum in, in Warsaw. And uh, so con continuing on this path for the Magnus and for all of us this week is phenomenal. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you that there are more programs coming up next week. On Wednesday, the 18th, Sarah Benar of Hebrew Union College is speaking here at the Magnus on Mensch, Bench, and Malagan, language as a marker of Jewish identity. Uh, the reception starts at 6.30 and the talk is at 7. The following evening, so the 19th, we'll have a concert here also, starting at 7 p.m., Jewish Song Lines, and it's a musical encounter between Esti Kanan Ofri, one of the leading li singers of Ladino Song from Israel, and Michael Alpert, one of the leading Yiddish singers in America and in the world. And with any further ado, Shana Penn, if you want to come and introduce the program tonight, welcome everybody, and... Uh, Good evening. I'm really excited to be able to introduce Sam, but before I do, a few comments. Um, the, um, the Toby Foundation is delighted to be able to co-host this event with the Magnus, UC Berkeley Center for Jewish Studies, and the Graduate Theological Union Center for Jewish Studies. Um, and we hope to be able to do more events like this together in the future. I also have uh, a quick announcement that the Toby Foundation, uh, which has a whole program in Poland, uh, is, is collaborating with the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs to sponsor two summer study tours to Poland for undergrad and graduate students uh, this summer. And there are, uh, and, it's, and it's in uh, Polish Jewish history and Polish history. And there are flyers on the um, table over there. So please, if you're students or faculty, please pick them up. And you can also speak to Alexandra Matko from the Toby Foundation if you have any questions. Um, Sam Cassell has uh, presented here um, several times in the past, and we are always happy to welcome him back to speak. Uh, Sam is the director of the Jewish Studies Program and the Charles H. Northam Professor of History at Trinity College in Connecticut in Hartford. He has taught courses in Jewish history at Harvard, Princeton, and Wesleyan, as well as at universities in Tel Aviv and Moscow. From 2010 to 2013, he served as chair of the Holocaust Division of the Association of Jewish Studies. Dr. Cassell is co-curator of the 19th century and interwar galleries of the new Pauline Museum of History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. Um, who's been to the, the museum yet by show of, show of hands? And who's planning to go? Great. Sam is the author of Who Will Write Our History, Emanuel Ringelblum and the Onik Shabbos Archive, published in 2007 by Indiana University Press. It receives the Orbis Prize of American Association for Advancement of Slavic Studies and was a finalist for the 2008 National Jewish Book Award. The New Republic, uh, in its review called, um, called uh, Who Will Write Our History, the best historiography ever written. Uh, it is now um, set to be adapted into a screen, uh, a, a screen film by the director, Robert, Robert, Roberta Grossman, and executive director, Nancy Spielberg. Uh, Roberta Grossman did the films Havana uh, Gila and the film uh, on Hannah Senesh and others. Sam is also in the process of completing a highly anticipated <coughs> book called Listen and Believe, the ghetto reportage of Peretz Opochinsky and Josef Zalkovich, which will be released this year by Yale. On February 16th of this year, Sam was honored in Warsaw, Poland for his service to Polish culture 
by the Polish Minister of Culture and National Heritage, uh, who presented him with a medal on the, in this special ceremony. Um, Sam's um, return here from Trinity for a visit is also uh, helping to extend the Trinity relationship to, to Berkeley. Uh, the president of GTU, Reese Potterfeld, graduated a year before Sam. And um, Sam was my professor at Trinity, Trinity in the years before Jewish studies existed formally. And um, I was a part of a cohort of students that were his guinea pigs in taking Yiddish, study, Yiddish, Yiddish literature and other Jewish studies programs. And um, without further ado, welcome Sam. Thank you, Dana, for those very kind words. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, Magnus and the Toby Foundation and the Graduate Theological Union in UC Berkeley. It, it's always wonderful to come back here, uh, especially uh, considering the kind of winter we've gone through in uh, New England. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Uh, in his uh, diary of the Warsaw Ghetto, the uh, noted uh, journalist, Hill Seidman, recalled how a friend once told him that since Polish Jewry was the center of world Jewry, and since Warsaw was the center of uh, Polish Jewry, and since the corner of Gensha and Nalewki was the center of Warsaw Jewry, it followed that if you didn't count the Wailing Wall, it was that spot that marked the real heart of the Jewish people. If there was any Jewish metropolis in pre-war Europe, it was Warsaw. Even though the shtetl remained important, in fact, it was the big cities that transformed East European Jewry in the 19th and 20th centuries. They offered both the opportunities lacking in the shtetl, and as Scott Urey's recent book on Warsaw has shown, also new anxiety fueled by crime, street violence, and dislocation. In the 19th century, Jews in great numbers migrated into the urban centers of Congress Poland. In 1856, Wuch had 3,000 uh, uh, Jews on the eve of World War II, about 250,000. Between 1862 and 1939, Warsaw's Jewish population increased ninefold from 40,000 to 360,000. Altogether in 1939, about 25% of Polish Jewry lived in the five biggest cities, Warsaw, Łódź, Lwów, Kraków, and Vilno, all of them communities with their own special character and history, and half still lived in small shtetls. This rapid urbanization, as Steve Zipperstein, Marsha Rosenblatt, and others have uh, mentioned, evoked mixed reactions from Jewish sociologists and historians Arthur Rubin complained that the large towns are, quote, one of the great factors of assimilation, hotbeds of, uh, of uh, Jewish disappearance. Shmuel Ettinger, the noted historian at Hebrew University, took a more balanced view. The big cities, he argued, offered a mix of challenges and opportunities. Yes, they undermined tradition and they fostered integration with the non-Jewish world. But on the other hand, the new urban milieu encouraged new models of Jewish community. This view was supported by a later generation of Jewish urban historians whose work on Odessa, St. Petersburg, Kiev, and Warsaw undercut and modified Dubnov's dichotomy of nationally conscious Jews of Eastern Europe and the less national acculturated Jews of Central and Western Europe. The new Jewish urban history has revealed the nuanced interplay 
of partial and bourgeoisement, new kinds of acculturation, and new modes of national self-definition. Uh, and Warsaw has also been lucky in scholarship. The research of Todd Endelman, Steve Corson, and most recently Scott Yuri has enriched, in many cases, revised the insights contained in Jacob Chofsky's pioneering and unfinished three-volume history of Jewish Warsaw. Yuri, clearly influenced by uh, Gellner and Kaduri, stressed how uh, Warsaw facilitated the construction of a new modern Jewish national consciousness. The unprecedented challenges of the metropolis and the cross currents of revolutionary politics allowed a new mass press and theater to supplant the influence of traditional Jewish elites. For Yuri, mass politics in the metropolis, the 1905 revolution, new election campaigns, new laws on organization and public meetings exacerbated inter-ethnic tensions, i.e. democracy is not always stabilizing in mixed ethnic areas, exacerbated inter-ethnic tensions, and helped turn Polish-Jewish relations into a kind of zero-sum game, where Poles now began to see the Jews as a threatening abstract other, even as Jewish migrants to Warsaw, many crowded into crime-ridden slums, honed a new ethnic consciousness in response. While my own reading of theories of uh, uh, nationalism owes more to Anthony Smith than to Gellner, I cite Yuri as an example of exciting new scholarship in Jewish urban history that offers a fresh look at Warsaw. Indeed, Warsaw helped transform Polish Jewry in many ways, through its newspapers, theaters, its major organizations, its role as a key center of new literatures in Hebrew and uh, Yiddish, uh, its role as a major base of Jewish labor unions. If Polish Jewry between the wars had a parliament, it was the Warsaw Community Council, where the tribunes of a Praxis community faced off in verbal combat. Debates were raucous. In 1931, the eminent Jewish historian Isaac Schiffer, a Zionist representative on the Community Council, hurled a water pitcher at a Aguda opponent, a rabbi. The meeting continued after a short recess. <laughs> Years ago, an Israeli acquaintance of mine remarked that it was no surprise that the Knesset lacked the court because Israeli political culture had taken its earliest cues from Warsaw Jewish politics. In 1939, Jewish Warsaw numbered 350,000 people, most of whom had come from somewhere else. But unlike Vilna or Krakow, Warsaw was not an old community. There was no remotion as we see in Krakow, no Gonskloids as we see in the Vilna that reminded Jews of a tradition that dated back hundreds of years. Poets who sang of Vilna stressed the themes of collective memory, introspective spirituality, the quiet majesty of the synagogue court. Many of you probably have heard that song, Vilna Stopf von Geist und Mimis, Vilna Yiddish Lachfalkach. Not so with Warsaw. If anything defined Warsaw, Jewish Warsaw, it was its hustle and its energy, its jarring contrast, the intense pandemonium of the huge Jewish courtyards, the haif of the Nalefki and the Gensha. Remember the opening scene in Bashevis Singers, the family Mushka, Meshulam Mushka, is returning from a vacation abroad. It's Warsaw before the First World War. First, Meshulam's carriage goes down the stately Polish streets, the majestic Marshalkowska, it passes the splendid Saxon gardens, and then, and now I quote from the beginning of Bashevis's novel, the carriage turned into Gzibov place, and abruptly everything changed. The street was a bedlam of sound and activity. Street peddlers called out their wares in ear-piercing chants, potato cakes, hot chickpeas, Hungarian plums, Although the evening was warm, the merchants wore outer coats with huge leather money pouches hanging from the belts. 
Wine, 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 shrieked the red-faced, red-headed peddler, displaying a basket of spoiled grapes. Nab them, grab them, nuzzle them, guzzle them, buy them, van, 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 coits, loats, hops. This is my invitation to Warsaw Yiddish, excuse me. <laughs> Reb Mishulam glanced out of the carriage. The land of Israel, huh? Muscat's new wife, a Galician widow, who'd never been to Warsaw before, gave him disbelief. What a foreign country. And if that's how a Jew felt, imagine the reactions of Poles and assimilated Jews. In 1934, a reporter for the most prestigious Polish literary magazine, the Fiadomoszczy Literackie, the Literary Review, this reporter's name was Wanda Meltzer, and she published a book of travel reportages entitled The Dark Continent. Was she talking about an exotic expedition to Africa? No, the book described her travels to territories that indeed were much further away. The mikvahs and the shtibbles of the Nalefki, the heart of Warsaw's Jewish section. I should add that even as Meltzer described this stark continent, in the northern part of her city, Polish nationalists detested the journal she wrote for and the culturated Jews like herself, who they saw as unwelcome intruders. After all, Fiadomoszczy, Poland's equivalent of the New York Review of Books or the Times Literary Supplement, was put up by largely Poles of Jewish origin and assimilated Jews. And many, maybe most of its readers, were actually Jews. Often writers refer to the, often uh, rightly nationalists refer to the journal with a nasty pun, Idon Moshki Literatskie. There go the literary types. In the minds of some Polish nationalists, the brilliant intellectuals and poets of this journal, as well as great poets of Jewish origin like Julian uh, Kubik or Antoni Swanimski, were even more dangerous than the capota-wearing Jews of the Nalefki skewered by Wanda Meltzer. But Meltzer's reportages also underscored the great diversity of Warsaw Jewry and the corrupt state of Polish-Jewish relations in the 1930s. While Vilna lived in the reflective glow of collective memory and a shared Lithuanian Jewish identity, Warsaw was busy uh, bringing together the different Jewish worlds and tribes that kept arriving. Warsaw was and was seen as a work in progress, raw, dynamic, and in its own way intensely Jewish. One important Yiddish uh, journalist, Leo Finkelstein, noted that Warsaw's threads derived not from Zkusovis, but from Zkusosma, not from its historical tradition, but from its sheer mass and power. Warsaw, Finkelstein believed, was not weighted down by encrusted tradition, and thus it could serve as a pathbreaker in the modernization of Jewish life. When Finkelstein thought of Warsaw, what he emphasized were the crowds, the 100,000 Jews who came to Peretz's funeral in 1950, the thousands who had welcomed the Gera Rebbe at the railroad station, the May Day parades with the red flag, Count Fyodopolsky's abolition of residence restrictions in 1862 opened the floodgates of Jewish immigration to Warsaw. Warsaw attracted Jewish immigrants from both Lithuania and the Polish shtetls, and it became a mosaic of different Jewish worlds, Hasidim and Misnagdi, Litvaks and Polish Jews, Polish-speaking integrationists and Jewish nationalists, a large Jewish middle class and the biggest Jewish proletariat in Europe. This kaleidoscope, this mosaic, generated an intense social and cultural energy, and most importantly, as I said before, critical mass. And more than any other city, Warsaw was the meeting point of Jews and Poles, the flashpoint of Polish-Jewish relations. Economic uh, growth powered this demographic surge, fostered by railroads built by Jewish converts like Jan Bloch and Leopold Kronenberg, railroads that took goods to the Russian market, and also by the Vistula River, which linked the Polish hinterland to Danzig. The European and the broad-gauge Russian railroad networks converged in Warsaw. By the turn of the century, 70% of the industrial production of Congress Poland rolled into the Russian interior. 
alongside heavy industry, where Jews were more often owners than actually workers, a large complex of medium and light industry developed in Warsaw, largely in the old Jewish quarter in the northern part of the town. Lodz was mainly a manufacturing town. Warsaw combined manufacturing with distribution, commerce, and financial services. Jewish merchants from all over Poland would come to the huge wholesale warehouses on Gensha and Nalewki to place orders for Finnish suits, coats, shoes, and textiles. In his memoirs, the well-known Jewish uh, journalist Bernard Singer recalled that, and I quote, the Nalewki sold clothing and socks. Gensha traded large and Russian products. Franciscanski Franciszkanska dealt with leather, the Jibov with iron. A whole array of Jewish porters and teamsters, including many colorful characters not so far from the underworld, would move goods between the warehouses, the Vistula docks, and the railroad stations. In the courtyards of Nalewki, Gensha, Smocha, there arose hundreds of small factories and businesses. Warsaw had two main centers of Jewish settlement. The oldest was Praga, the east side of the Vistula. Then in the second half of the 19th century, a new Jewish quarter emerged in North Warsaw, around Nalewki, Gensha, and going south to Zhibovska. Keep in mind that pre-1918 Warsaw as a whole had very little space to accommodate the burgeoning Jewish population. The Russians had ringed the northern borders of the city with fortifications that stymied natural expansion. And so when the boom years began in the 1880s, there was very little room to build. And hence the great Haif, the huge multi-story courtyards that characterized much of Warsaw's Jewish quarter right down to World War II. And here we have a picture of a typical Jewish courtyard on the Nalewki. And what you don't see, though, is that very often these courtyards would then uh, back up into a second courtyard and a third courtyard. In 1947, the Yiddish actor Avram Teitelbaum published his memoirs of growing up in Warsaw. The book was entitled Valshavar Hey, Warsaw Courtyards. And he traced his life through the series of different courtyards that his family lived in. Each courtyard was a world unto itself, with tenements, workshops, synagogues, and chadarim, one-room religious schools. A typical Warsaw courtyard contained as many Jews as an average shtetl, sometimes three or four thousand. In times of trouble, the courtyard, the hoif, with its massive gate, imparted a sense of security. For a small child, a title bomb recalls, there was the endless wonder of wandering around the dozens of small workshops in the courtyard or gaping at the wandering magicians and acrobats, not to mention the fortune tellers who trained white mice to pull out a kvitle, little tickets that were Warsaw's answer to the Chinese fortune cooking. From early on in the morning, peddlers and craftsmen, knife sharpeners and carpenters would appear in the hoif in the courtyard and yell for business, handle, handle, handle. Bernard Singer recalled that in Friedman's passage on Spente Erska, and I quote, you could live your whole life and not have to go out into the street. There were two shuls, there was a Gerstiebel, there were haters, bakeries, and hotels. Each courtyard had enormous variety and diversity. In these courtyards, the city met the shtetl. Modern welfare organizations worked alongside traditional forms of, of philanthropy and self-help. A major traditional charity inherited from the shtetl was a well-known Warsaw institution called Guchabis Yidele, Good Shabbos Jews. On Friday mornings, its members would enter the huge courtyards and call out Good Shabbos Yidelech, and Jews would toss down food to help the poor celebrate the Sabbath. Yet during the interwar period, alongside these traditional organizations, of which there were hundreds, a new network of professional social services began to develop. 
One of these new professional organizations was the PAUSE, the Society to Improve the Health of Polish Jews. And here we see a typical PAUSE poster. A sickly Jew, clearly not very healthy and not very happy, is being uh, schlepped up the stairs by a very buff Jew. And uh, the poster says, Hit aya gizud, Guard your health, support the Torah. <clears throat> this network of new social organizations became a major employer of the Jewish intelligentsia. And in the Warsaw Ghetto, these alighted into the Alenhil, the self-help, a key institution in the ghetto headed by Emanuel Ringelblum that rested on more than, that depended on more than 1,000 house uh, committees. In the sprawling Jewish neighborhoods of Warsaw, the underworld was a constant problem. Pips, strong-armed men, extortionists became an integral part of Warsaw Jewish life and of its folklore. The crooks even had their own shul near the Gensha Cemetery. On Kol Nidre, as the journalist Jankov Botachansky pointed out in a wonderful reportage, the Polish police would, would take their charges in handcuffs to David. <laughs> there was also, according to Botachansky, a well-known pickpocket shul in Warsaw, where visitors were warned that even though one should close one eyes and say the Shema, in this shul it was probably better not to. Now, I also heard this concern Vilna, but not Warsaw, and I can't track down the source. I'm trying to, that the uh, Jewish safe crackers in Vilna had their shul, and they had a slogan, Absak Shogun Bechachma, open your gates with wisdom. And this was the slogan, <laughs> safe One of the uh, favorite pastimes of the Warsaw underworld was extortion and protection money. And indeed, uh, Teitelbaum describes how his mother had a hard time with her restaurant, always having to pay protection money. Between the wars, there was a popular Yiddish folk song about an extortionist called Harshal, who used to shake down sto storekeepers on Schwentajerska Street. A rival gang, led by a tough character named Meyer Trumbull, dethroned Harshal. And so the refrain goes, Harshul di Steiste, Harshul di Biste mit einer Gube hent, du Hosche nischka hent, du Wäsche nicht nehmen nach Schwente Erzke kein Problem. Harshul, you're out of business. Harshul, you're not going to shake anybody down anymore because you've been dethroned by Meyer Trumbull. When Yitzhak Leibusch Peretz began his battle in 1908 for a, quote, better Yiddish theater, unquote, one of his goals was to liberate the Yiddish theater from its financial dependence on the underworld. In a very real sense, the struggle with the underworld was a major factor behind the rise of the Bund in Jewish Warsaw. One didn't just join the Bund, the Jewish Socialist Party, to fight for better working conditions or political revolution. For many Jewish workers in Warsaw, joining the Bund was a way of saying, I'm going to aim higher. I'm going to reject the pimps and the gangsters. I'm going to raise myself. And during the turbulent violence of the 1905 uh, 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 revolution, several of the brothels were attacked and torched. The Jewish quarter in northern Warsaw remained the center of Jewish settlement right up until 1939, and it was the center of the Warsaw Ghetto. Now, as I said, the two main sources of Jewish immigration to Warsaw were from the small towns of Poland and from Lithuania. By 1880, on the eve of the beginning of the great Litvak emigration to Warsaw, Jacob Shotsky wrote that two-thirds of the synagogues in Warsaw were Hasidic, and Hasidism left an indelible stamp on Warsaw, indeed, on the entire face of Polish Jewry. Polish Hasidism was a kaleidoscope of dozens of micro-worlds that embraced both rich and poor, micro-communities that for a long time combined shared religious experience with effective networking that uh, 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 brought in business 
and provided help in time of need. In Warsaw, the most important Hasidic court was that of Ger, and it remained so right until the end. In Rosh Hashanah, 1938, the last Rosh Hashanah before the war, 80,000 Ger Hasidim descended on the little shtetl to hear the Ger Rebbe uh, uh, blow the shofar. The narrow gauge railroad between Warsaw and Ger was always packed. And I remember my first trip to Gura Kalbaleria Ger in 1985, an elderly Pole was mourning the glory days of Ger when there was a Zhidovsky Papiej, when there was a Jewish Pope, and money was flowing into the town. The original Ger Rebbe, the Chidushe Harim, Ichemer Alter, was succeeded in 1870 by a charismatic and very effective heir, his uh, grandson, the Spa Semis, uh, Yehuda Ariyale. And then in 1905, when the Spa Semis died, he was succeeded by Avram Mordechai, the Ibre Emes. And this is a picture of the Ger Rebbe. Unlike other Hasidic Rebbe's, the Ger Rebbe's had a keen eye for the real world and saw the rising Jewish metropolis of Warsaw as an opportunity rather than a threat. Not only did the Ger dynasty develop extensive business contacts, but it emerged as a political leader of Polish Jewry and the heart and soul of the major Orthodox party, the Aguda. Ger played a key role in the modernization of Polish Jewish Orthodoxy, the Aguda the development of a daily press, the Tagablad, and even the transformation of Orthodox education. When Sarah uh, Schneer Sh Sh proposed a new school system for Jewish girls, the Besyankov system, she got the support of the Ger Rebbe. And it's important to note that Ger disciples included some of the wealthiest and most politically important Warsaw Jewish businessmen, like Jarl Wegmeister and Shia Priebus, and this was a major source of its power. From 1871 until the mid-1920s, the Jewish Community Council in Warsaw, the Kahila, was dominated by an unholy, kind of weird alliance of wealthy Hasidim and Polish-speaking professionals and businessmen. It's not a great picture, but you can kind of see this uh, combination of Hasidim and middle-class Jewish entrepreneurs and professionals. What these two very disparate groups had in common was a shared hostility to modern Jewish ideologies, such as Bundism or Zionism. And this helps explain the fact that the secularization and the modernization of Polish Jews as opposed to Lithuanian Jewry, would come much later and was more discordant. And it was the Litvaks who imported many of the modern Jewish ideologies to Warsaw and who led the assault on this unholy alliance of Hasidim and integrationists. Beginning around 1880, we see a major migration of Lithuanian Jews into Warsaw, maybe up to 80 to 100,000, if we also count Wuj. Uh, there were many reasons for this. Economic conditions were better. The legal status of Jews was better in Congress Poland than in the Pale. And remember, Congress Poland was under Russian rule, but it was not in the Pale of Settlement. And if we look at some memoirs, and we could get some insight into why Litvox went to this strange new growing metropolis. One memoir is by a young woman named Pua Rakowska from Bialystok, who left her loveless marriage, turned her back on her Orthodox parents, and went to Warsaw to get an education, to start a school for women, and to fight for women's rights. And Pua Rakowska would establish the first high school for Jewish girls, where Hebrew was an essential part of the curriculum. And I quote, it was painful for me to move suddenly to another world, Warsaw, where even the Jews were foreign to me. In the 46 years I lived there, I remained the Litva. 
I was absolutely unable to assimilate with my Polish brothers and sisters. Another quote, living my independent life along with my teaching, I didn't forget my inner obligation to fight for the freedom of Jewish women, always the most enslaved of all by self-appointed guardians who burdened them always and apparently wanted to save their souls. There is another memoir written by a young man, Avram Zak, who would later become a well-known Yiddish poet. And he was vegetating in a shtetl near Lomza. And I quote, why are you sitting in this dump? My sister asked me. Go to Warsaw. There you'll have an interesting life. My lord, Warsaw, the city of newspapers, the city of writers, until now, I've never seen a real writer in my entire life. There's parrots, rays, and denizens whose books I've read. But the trip to Warsaw also reminded Zak of the enormous differences between himself and Litvak and the Polish Jews. Quote, the journey took all night. Passengers come and go. And then strange Jews come on board in capotes and robes and weird smallish hats. Polish Jews. For the first time, I heard their drawing, drawling dialect. It's so strange. I look at them as if they're Jews from another tribe. End of quote. There was little love lost between the Polish Jews and the Litvaks. Litvaks suspected the Polish Jews were feckless Bohemians at heart and called them Pelishapitkis, Polish Slavs, and Ichemias because so many Polish Jews named their kids after the first Gera Rebbe, Ichemeyer. I remember my, my mother actually used to call them Ichemeyer. And the Polish Jews didn't really like the newcomers. One said, I saw yesterday a policeman who arrested two Jews and a Litvak. <laughs> and uh, they uh, also called the Litvaks Salemkep, people with crosses on their heads, because supposedly they were less religious so there are crosses on their foreheads, and the Litvaks would respond, that's when you push me cup. You don't have to kiss me on the head, implying they could kiss them somewhere else. In, 19, in 1921, the Moment, uh, a newspaper owned by the Litvaks, the Prilutsky, reported on the first meeting in Warsaw of a secular Yiddish school organization, the Tsisho. And the reporter asked, why were all the delegates and why were all the teachers actually Litvaks? And the reporter said, well, they're like the Scots. They come from a beautiful but poor country. And they have to turn into hard-working misers who can't afford to waste time. Not for them the lifestyle of the Polish Jew, the reporter said. Long hours dancing and drinking at the Rebbe's, eating good food, singing Nigunim tunes. The Litvaks get things done, and they leave their native land in droves to settle in and take over places like Warsaw and Lodz. And even the Yiddish language reflected the psychological difference. A Polish Jew, gate essen, he goes to eat. He enjoys his food. He looks forward to his food. A Litvak, gate opessen. A Litvak just is going to wolf something down. He's going to eat his herring and potatoes as fast as he can so he can get on to something more important. Now, I remember reading Yankiv uh, Glachstein, the great Yiddish poet who was born in Lublin. And he recalled what he and his countrymen used to think about the Lithuanian Jews. For us Polish Jews, Lithuanian Jews were absolutely polar opposites. The sharp edges, the way of speaking, the laconic silence, the reserve. It's as if God had set out to create a Jew totally unlike us, someone who would give us, let's not kid ourselves, an inferiority complex. At first, there was little contact in Warsaw between the two tribes. The Litvaks founded their own synagogues. The Mariah, for example, had their own hangouts, Kotik's Cafe, which Scott Yuri writes a lot about, and their own institutions, such as Achiezer, self-help organization. But in time, the differences began to fade, and many of the children of Litvaks became real Warsaw Jews. The Lithuanian Jewish immigration marked Jewish Warsaw in many ways. <coughs> Litvak immigrants, as I said, imported to a great extent <coughs> the new ideologies 
of Buddhism and Zionism. And we see this in the memoirs of the well-known Buddhist John Mill. Litvak, such a spoily Otskan, and the Prelutsky founded the great mass Yiddish newspapers, Heint and Moment. After the 1905 revolution, these new dailies replaced the old venerable Hebrew weekly, such as Hatzfira. These newspapers helped to create a new perception of urban space, a red city, R-E-A-D. Yatskan was a brilliant entrepreneur who cleverly founded a new kind of paper that broke with the stodgy traditions of the old weekly journals, such as Israelite and Hatzfira. They fed readers a racy mix of current news, feuilletons, true crime, trashy melodrama, serious literary criticism, and articles about streets in different neighborhoods. On one page, you could read Hill's Zeitlin about Chabad and the first Lubavitcher Rebbe. The next page, a serialized soap opera about a Hasidic Shepachter, a Hasidic daughter who becomes a madam in the Buenos Aires whorehouse. <laughs> or a story from a trustworthy source, of course, uh, about the Prince of Wales, who had apparently fallen in love with a poor girl from Whitechapel. The reportage of the Warsaw Jewish newspapers became a virtual travelogue that deciphered the tumultuous diversity of Polish Jewry and explained Jews to other Jews. Shtetl dwellers wanted to know what was happening in the city. Modern secular Jews loved to hear gossip about Hasidic rebbies. Hasidim avidly read exposés of crafty criminals. Yiddish-speaking Jews in the 20s and 30s devoured biting satires of the Schmendrikes, the Polish speakers, and their shallow pretensions. Wherever they lived, Jews were especially eager to know the inner contours of the city, the milieu of specific streets, the exotic secret world of the Jewish teamsters, porters, and butchers. They also wanted to know about the Poles, those neighbors whom they saw in the streets, but never in their homes. Every self-respecting Yiddish newspaper also had its own court reporter who somehow retrieved inside scoops from the police of, of Blada. The Litvak migration to Warsaw complicated worsening relations between Poles and Jews. Poles accused the Litvaks of being Russifiers, of being indifferent to Polish concerns, and even worse, of infecting native Polish Jews with the dangerous virus of Jewish nationalism. The rise of the mass press bolstered Warsaw's claim as a center of modern Hebrew and Yiddish culture. Here Yitzhak Leibush Paris played a key role. Like a Tad Ha'ad, and here we see, by the way, the newspaper wall in the new Jewish Museum in uh, Warsaw, showing the great variety of Jewish newspapers in interwar Poland, in Polish and in Yiddish. This is Yitzhak Leibush Peretz, photographed in, uh, by, by his death. Like Achad Ha'am, Yitzhak Leibush Peretz believed that a rejuvenated culture could save the Jewish people caught between stultifying orthodoxy and sterile assimilationism. Unlike Achad Ha'am, he believed that the answer lay with a vibrant Yiddish culture based in the diaspora a culture that would combine Jewish tradition and European liberal humanism. Peretz believed in Deutkeit, in here-ness, our home is here. He also hoped that culture would bring together Jews and Poles and help them develop more respect for each other. One could say that Peretz recycled religious themes and especially Hasidic themes into his uh, different writings. For example, Monish, the weakening hold of tradition, the golden cake, the waning of authority, Bildu, the problem of finding a synthesis between European culture and Jewish tradition, Mesira Snefesh, the power of self-sacrifice and moral example, Fonsha Shvai, the paradoxes and dangers of trying to fit ordinary Jews into the Procrustean bed of ready-made ideologies. The Jewish people, Peretz believed, were ready for a new authority figure, a new prophet, the writer, the poet, the artist. 
But Paris was no extreme Yiddishist, and he was certainly no political radical. At the Chernovitz Conference on Yiddish in 1908, he defended Hebrew and rejected calls to anoint Yiddish as the national language of the Jewish people rather than a national language. He also feared that the Bund and the left would force Yiddish writers and artists into the straitjacket of political uh, correctness. In the history of Jewish Warsaw, Peretz did more than anyone else to make Warsaw into a Yiddish literary center. I and mean, you just have to read the different memoirs of young Yiddish writers, Kaganowski and Sholem Ash and Yud Yud uh, Trump, who would, with great fear and trepidation, knock on Peretz's door, and Peretz would let them in, and they'd read their manuscripts, and then he would pronounce judgment uh, come back on Saturday or go back to your day job. And uh, if Brian Kaganowski's first visit to Paris, Kaganowski was in a big winter overcoat. Paris said, take off your coat. Kaganowski couldn't do it because all he had to his name was a pair of torn trousers. And finally he explained to Paris why he couldn't take off his uh, coat. Paris's sudden death in 1915 was seen as a tremendous loss. And here's a cartoon showing Yiddish literature, looking at the empty chair of Paris, Paris's picture on the, the wall. And the caption is, who is going to replace you? Who is, going to, who is going to lead us? In the 1920s, in the writer's club at the Tlamatske, there would be a big picture of Paris hanging down from the wall. And today, one of the few Jewish landmarks that have survived in Warsaw is Paris's tomb, the Ohel Paris. No city was more critical for Polish-Jewish relations than Warsaw. Warsaw Jews were major supporters of Polish art, music, and Polish letters. They provided much of the audience for the Polish theater. One should mention Matthias Bersin's role in uh, as a patron of Polish artists, Samuel Orgelbrand's role as a publisher of the most important Polish encyclopedia, funded by profits from the sales of his Hebrew books. Many wealthy Jews followed the lead of Hippolyt Babelberg, give at least as much money to Polish charities as to Jewish charities. Babelberg funded the publishing of Polish classics in cheap editions. He was the single biggest contributor to Warsaw's Mickiewicz Monument. He endowed a polytechnic with the proviso that there'd never be any religious barriers to admission. And the uh, uh, academic authorities violated that promise in the 1930s when they imposed a Jewish quota. The high point, the best time of Polish-Jewish relations came early, in 1861-1863, when the Poles rose up again against Russia. And this period of Polish-Jewish uh, uh, brotherhood, which was so, so short-lived, was called the Zbratania, the coming together. And the slogan was Kachaimisha, let us love one another. There was a first generation of young Jews who had been educated in the Polish language, many at a rabbinical school that had never graduated a single rabbi, but began a Polish-speaking Jewish intelligentsia. In 1861, Cossacks fired into a patriotic demonstration that claimed both Polish and Jewish victims. The Jewish painter, Alexander, uh, this is the, uh, uh, some of the Yiddish writers from uh, Tlamatsky at the Writers Club. And now we come to Alexander Lesser's painting, uh, The Funeral of the Five. At the funeral of the five victims who were killed by the Cossacks in 1861, alongside the Catholic Bishop Fielkowski, you had a Protestant minister and you had two Jewish rabbis. Uh, Doug Bear Meisels and Marcus Jastrow. And they both gave unqualified support to the Polish cause. Many young Jews were exiled to Siberia and many were executed. 
One very important painter, Alexander Sochachevsky, was sentenced to death. And he was about to be hanged when his sentence was commuted to 20 years hard exile in Siberia. And he became this Polish Jew, one of the most inspiring Polish patriotic painters. And this painting is entitled Farewell to Europe. And it shows Polish fighters who are about to leave the European side of the Ural Mountains and cross into Siberia. And Sokhachevsky himself is standing by the obelisk. After the uh, failure of the revolution of the abortive revolt of 1863, there was a new ideology in Poland called positivism. The belief that the time for insurrections has passed, we shouldn't beat our heads against the wall anymore. Like the Czechs, we should build up our country from the ground up. Schools, roads, industry, culture, and that's how we'll defend the Polish nation. And the ideology of Polish positivism welcomed Jews. It welcomed the talent that Jews could bring to the building of a new Poland. And Warsaw's Jewish elites responded in kind. A new weekly journal, the Israelita, became the great tribute of positivism and this new vision of integration. And the Warsaw Jewish positivists and integrationists consecrated the splendid Klamatsky Synagogue in 1878. And this is the inauguration of the Klamatsky Synagogue. The leading Jewish families gave money. Wives and daughters of the Jewish elite sewed for the, uh, for the uh, cloth over the ark for the parochis. Ludwig Nathanson, the head of the Polish Medical Association, imported cedar wood from Lebanon at his own expense. The Tlamatsky Synagogue reflected the integrationist faith in a lasting bond between the Jews and Poland. When the synagogue was inaugurated, they put a time capsule into the uh, structure, uh, which contained Jewish and Polish newspapers from the time. Jurgen Strup, the SS commander who put down the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, celebrated his defeat of the Jewish fighters by blowing up the synagogue on May 16, 1943. And he complained that the synagogue was so well built that it took German engineers a long time to blow it up. The Tlamatsky Synagogue chose Isaac Silko as their new rabbi. Silko had translated the Bible into Polish. And at the inauguration, Silkov did a very daring thing. He was told not to give his inaugural speech in Polish, but he turned to face the Russian governor, and he spoke in Polish anyway. Silkov and the Jews who founded the Tlamatsky Synagogue hoped that it would attract the children of the Hasidic masses that it would make them more civilized, and that it would deter children of wealthy Jewish families from converting to Catholicism. The Tlamatsky Synagogue was supposed to show that you could be a pole of the Mosaic persuasion. But no sooner had the Tlamatsky Synagogue been built than storm clouds began to appear. A pogrom broke out in Warsaw in December 1881. The pogrom shocked the Polish intelligentsia. These things happened in Russia, but never in Poland. We're too civilized for this kind of anti-Jewish violence. But nonetheless, Polish-Jewish relations began to decline. First of all, uh, positivism itself lost support. It was attacked for being too materialistic for ignoring the key role of the Catholic Church in Polish consciousness. 
a new doctrine of Polish nationalism developed, which said that unless the Poles had their own middle class, they could never be a real nation. And that meant that somehow they had to eliminate Jews from Polish life. Not only the new Polish nationalism, led by Roman Lewandowski, but also erstwhile allies, like Polish liberal progressives, now began to rethink their former support of Jews. Progressives, like Alexander Świętokowski, had said, we had hoped that you would embrace Polish culture and become Poles. What's this nonsense all of a sudden with Yiddish, with jargon, as they called it? Polish liberals automatically assumed that Yiddish was inferior and that Jews would rush to give it up. The, the great Polish writer Ozieszkowa said, who would have thought that the Jews would start to read Yiddish books? Polish liberals felt betrayed. And the more Jews began to embrace Jewish nationalism, especially in Warsaw, the more fearful they became that the Jews were trying to start a state within a state. The growing crisis in Polish-Jewish relations reached a breaking point in the Duma elections of 1912, when Jews faced a terrible choice. The quirky electoral law gave Jews the power to decide who would represent Warsaw in the Russian parliament. Would they enrage Poles by denying Poles the right to choose their candidate, even if that candidate, in this case, opposed equal rights for Jews and local government? The Jews of the Tlamatsky Synagogue, the assimilationists and the integrationists, begged their fellow Jews to swallow their pride, stay away, and simply not vote. Let the Jews, let the Poles decide who is going to represent Warsaw. But Peretz let a revolt. Like hell, he said, the time is long gone when we would kiss the boots of the Polish prince. And so the Jews, through their support, to a Polish socialist. And this touched off a firestorm of Polish outrage. And Polish liberals joined nationalists in attacking Jews. And this was a turning point in Polish-Jewish relations. In the future, they would be less bad, or they would be worse, but they would never be good. And this was the final defeat of the integrationists. Israel lived out their journal, closed down for good in 1915. Indeed, more and more Jews would speak Polish, but they would be Jewish first. And the Tlamansky synagogue itself was a barometer. The rabbis who succeeded Silko, Shmuel Samuel Poznanski, and then of, of Moshe Shor, were eminent scholars. They gave their lectures in Polish but they were no longer Poles of the Mosaic persuasion. They were Zionists. Even as assimilation waned, acculturation continued to grow. Between the wars, the vast majority of Jewish children, unlike the case in Vilna, were attending Polish state schools with Polish as the language of instruction. By 1939, a higher proportion of Warsaw Jews, especially young people, spoke Polish than ever before. On the one hand, they were imbued with what Chris, uh, Catherine Stefan called Jewish Polishness, based on an interpretation of Polish culture that stressed its universalist mission and its humanity. This new Jewish cult of Polishness emphasized Mickiewicz and Slavatsky, emphasized the leadership of Pilsudski, it hoped that anti-Semitism would wane and the spirit of 1861 would someday return. But this new Jewish Polishness was Jewish as well as Polish. These Polish-speaking Jews wanted to live as proud, self-respecting members of the Jewish people. If the great Yiddish papers, Heint and Moment, had helped form the modern character of Jewish Warsaw. Then by the 1930s, Nash Pszegno, the Warsaw Jewish daily newspaper in the Polish language, was just as important. And uh, 
it's interesting to ask, why is it that in the United States, Jews will read the New York Times, and they might read a weekly Jewish newspaper, but in Poland, they were so alienated from the mainstream Polish press that they needed their own daily Jewish press in the Polish language. And here's a, a beauty contest sponsored by Nash Sheglon, Miss Judea, who will be the prettiest Jewish woman in Poland. And this is a woman's magazine, a weekly published by the wife of the editor of Nash Sheglon, called Eva. What was happening in Warsaw confirmed Honish Maruk's thesis that interwar Polish Jewry was living in a cultural poly system using three different languages, Polish, Yiddish, and Hebrew, that complemented and perhaps reinforced each other. In other words, the emerging Polish-speaking Jewish community still needed Yiddish to provide literature and theater. In 1918, after Poland regained her independence, Warsaw brought together both Ju Poles and Jews. Poles who'd been under different partitions were now unified by this new capital city. The Poles built new neighborhoods, they built new institutions, and by the same token, Warsaw unified the different Jewish tribes, the Galicianers, the Jews from central Poland, and the Litvaks, who now found themselves uh, under uh, the same national roof. Uh, and Warsaw developed key institutions. Here's the Cafe Zemianska, a hangout of Polish-speaking Jewish writers and uh, journalists. Uh, this is Janusz Korczak and his, and his orphanage. This is the Jewish Writers Club on Klobatsky 13. And we see Fifi the cat, we see Nomberg dancing to the fox trap, and we see Parrots, who's already uh, in heaven, uh, looking down from the clouds and saying, what's going on here? And Sean Malachan is holding him by the feet and to keep him from falling. And Parrot says, what is this for, what, is this really Yiddish literature? And Sean Malachan says, no, they're creating Jewish culture. Um, Polish Jews in the 20s and 30s fought hard for their rights, but it was an uphill battle. Although Poland was 40% ethnic minority, most Poles saw interwar Poland as an ethnic nation state. There was also a growing tendency to see Jews as aliens whose emigration from Poland should be dis in encouraged. Perhaps had economic conditions been better, Polish-Jewish relations might have improved. But the legacy of wartime devastation and the loss of traditional Russian markets added to the woes of the Great Depression. In theory, Polish Jews enjoyed equal rights. In practice, they were second-class citizens. Jews could vote, they had basic civil rights, but they lacked the clout to block anti-Jewish measures that were backed by a majority of Polish parties. <laughs> Indeed, Polish Jews were much better off under the semi-authoritarian rule of Joseph Pilsudski than they were under parliamentary rule. In interwar Poland, Polish Jews pursued every conceivable political strategy to defend themselves. Polish Zionists, led by the charismatic Yitzhak Greenbaum, sought to maximize Jewish leverage by creating a bloc with other minorities. In 1922, this minorities bloc won many votes and was the deciding factor in the election of a liberal Polish president, Gabriel Narutowicz who was promptly assassinated by a nationalist madman who asserted that only Poles and no one else should decide who would run the country. We can't let the national minorities decide who will govern us. Greenbaum's strategy soon collapsed. The Orthodox Agudas Yisroel preferred to collaborate with the government. Under Pilsudski, the Aguda did very well. 
and uh, got a lot of support. But after Pilsudski died, his successors humiliated the Aguda and his strategy by limiting kosher slaughter. In the 1930s, Polish Zionism began to decline as Britain cracked down on immigration to Palestine and a Jewish state seemed farther away than ever. Many Polish Jewish youth at first gravitated to communism, but uh, this too lost its allure in the late 1930s because of the purges and because Stalin dissolved the Polish Communist Party. Even though this idea that Jews were communists, the Żyda Komuna, was a basic staple of Polish anti-Semitism, the fact remained that in the one election where we can gauge Jewish support for communism, only about 5% of Jews voted for communist front organizations. Many communists were Jewish, 30% of the Polish Communist Party was Jewish, larger than their percentage in the population, but very, very few Jews were communists. So with the other major political options in decline, on the eve of World War II, Polish Jewry and Warsaw Jewry turned to the boom. In the key municipal election in 1938, the Bund got 61% of the Warsaw Jewish vote and 18 of the 20 Jewish seats on the Warsaw City Council. Now, I do not believe that Warsaw Jews suddenly turned into committed Bundists. As one Jewish newspaper said, Jews voted for, for the Bund on the way to Mincha, on the way to afternoon prayers. But the reasons why Warsaw Jews turned to the Bund were very instructive. First, the other parties seemed to have reached a dead end. Zionism could only show 3,000 Jews emigrating to Palestine in 1938 out of a population of three and a half million. The Bund offered an alternative. The alternative was doikai, here-ness. Our home is here. And this poster says, that where we live, that's our home. You want us to th flee Poland? Aftsalochus, go to hell, we'll stay. This is our home, we have a right to be here. After the death of Pilsudski in 1935, anti-Semitic violence escalated. A pogrom in Minsk Mazowiecki in 1936, uh, attacks on Jewish students in front of Warsaw University. And as this anti-Semitic violence escalated, the Bund organized goon squads to defend Jews and it called nationwide protest strikes to protest the pogroms. The Bund reminded Jews that if fascism triumphed in Europe, then even Palestine would offer no safety. And the Bund was the only Jewish party that had a Polish ally, the PPS, the Polish Socialists. The Bund reassured Polish Jews that ultimately the Polish people would see that anti-Semitism offered no solution to the nation's problems, and then things would get better. The Bund was the party that was most involved in the day-to-day -day life of the Jewish masses. Here's a picture from the Medem Sanatorium, a sanatorium established for poor Jewish children outside of, of Warsaw. In conclusion, as arguments raged between Zionists and Bundists about the future of Polish Jewry, all sides look to the big cities, and especially to Warsaw, to find evidence for their prognoses. The Bund saw the glasses half full for Polish Jews. The future of Polish Jewry, the Bund said, was in the big cities like Warsaw, not the shtetl. In the big cities, the Jews were becoming workers. They were leaving the confines of petty commerce. They were no longer vulnerable to economic boycotts. In the big cities, they could defend themselves better. Zionists looked to those same big cities and they saw the glasses half empty. The Warsaw Jews who worked in factories made lower wages, they didn't have social benefits, and they were being pushed to the margins of the economy. On the eve of the war, 
Polish Jewry was beleaguered, but it was fighting hard to defend itself. And through it all, Polish Jews could still laugh at themselves. There was this cabaret team called Jigan and Schumacher. And according to Nahama Sandro, and I can't find the original skit, but they did a skit that got them into trouble. It was called The Last Jew in Poland. And in the skit, the dream of the Polish anti-Semites has come uh, true. The Jews have all left Poland, but then the Poles look around and they say, oh my God, we're so bored, there's nothing to do. The economy is ruined, there are no cabarets, there are no Jews to beat up, the students are depressed. But then they find one Jew, the guy who was late in getting out. The government delegation comes to him, begs him not to leave. The students organize a campaign to keep the last Jew from emigrating. They stage a banquet, they play Yiddish songs. The Jew sets a condition, he wants gefilte fish and chong and rugelet, the Polish radio issues an urgent appeal for someone who could cook the filter fish. They even give the Jew medals, including Polonia Restituta, which Jigan apparently, from what Nahama Sandro says, he pins the two medals to each side of his posterior, and then he turns his back to the audience and takes a deep bow while the, while the uh, uh, stage lights focus on the medals hanging from Jigan's Mechelsa. You know, uh, the, uh, as the curtain falls, a Polish choir sings Stolat, a Polish song, to the Jew. The next day, Jigan apparently was summoned to the police, and the skit was closed down. But one point is clear. Warsaw is important in the life of Polish Jewry, steadily increased. By the eve of the war, war Warsaw, more than ever, had become the political and cultural center of Polish Jewry. And no matter how desperate the economic and the political situation was, it was Warsaw that provided the critical mass that could sustain a network of national institutions even in tough times. Unfortunately, tough times for Warsaw's fractious Jewish, fractured Jewish leadership meant coping with the challenges of Polish anti-Semitism. The Nazi occupation confronted the community with unprecedented calamities just when many of the most important leaders had fled the city. But that's another story. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yeah, in, 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 in the back. Yeah, the Galicianers were different from, uh, was, was there a Galician subculture di different from the culture of Central Polish Jews or Litvaks, right? Warsaw. Yeah, within Warsaw. Yes, well, l l l let's start from the beginning. The, Galiz the Galician Jews did not migrate in great numbers to Warsaw before World War I because Galicia was under Habsburg rule and because Politically, the Jews in the Habsburg Empire were much better off than the Jews in the Russian Empire. Even though economically, quite often they were poor, politically they were much better off. Don't quote us in the schools and so on. So only a Galicianer who was Meshuggah would think of migrating to Russia. So there was very little migration before World War I. Now, after 1918, when Poland became independent, you had a mass migration of Galician educated intellectuals to Warsaw because the Galician educational system was in Polish before World War I and the Galician middle class uh, got the best level of Polish education of any of the tribes that later made up Polish Jewry. 
So in a new circumstances where you really needed a good mastery of the Polish language, many Galician Jews uh, went to Warsaw, they went to Vilna, they went to Białystok. Many were greatly resented as people who uh, fomented acculturation and assimilation. Uh, but uh, they played a very important role in the interwar period, not so much before the war. But there was a different subculture in that they were not under Russian rule. And so that made them different. And the first place where, where Jews of all these different tribes really met, besides Warsaw, was uh, in, in the, the cities of emigration, New York and London and, and, and so on. Yeah. Thank you for helping me understand my father's family. It was Vilna, it was not Warsaw, but I heard a lot of the same stories uh, from him. And hmm. it didn't, you know, as a kid listening to it, wasn't anything that I observed, and this talk tonight really means a lot to me. Helps Thank me you. Understand. Um, when, when Poland was having all kinds of financial difficulties later, and uh, I contributed money to care for, for care and told my father about it, his response was, say, don't you have it then? Say, don't you have it yeah, uh, there, there, there was, a, I'd say, a, a certain degree of tension between the Jews who left Poland and, and Poles. And I do remember as a, as a youngster watching the Winter Olympics in uh, televised from Squaw Valley in 1960. My parents were Holocaust survivors. And uh, one of my mother's friends was making very uncomplimentary remarks about the ski jumpers that may they break their necks and so on. But that said, uh, it's a much more complicated story. I mean, one of the things we hope to do with the museum is to honor that we should at least remember, we should at least remember that things were not always terrible, that there were Jews who loved Poland, who risked their lives for Poland, uh, who loved the Polish language. Uh, you had the Bund that believed, perhaps, na perhaps naively, it's not for me to say, that uh, things would get better. And while we don't have to agree with that, we should at least remember that and honor that. And I think one of the things we're hoping to do with the museum is to uh, remind people that things were a little bit more nuanced than we tend to believe. A again, by 1939, uh, eight, about 60, depending on, on the region, in Galicia, 85% of Jewish kids were getting their education in the Polish language. Yiddish was on the defensive. A new kind of Jewishness in the Polish language was beginning to develop. It was cut short by the Holocaust. But this Jewish identification with Poland, and especially with Polish literature, with the traditions of Polish literature, and this, and even Zionism in many ways, and again, I, as I, I was looking at my watch and I really cut out a lot of things I wanted to talk about, but one of the interesting things about Polish Zionism was that it took many Polish qualities, or qualities that were revered in Polish culture, the building of a nation, heroism, uh, uh, chivalry, and it recycled them into Jewish values. This was especially true of people like Jabotinsky and Menachem Begin. And so the interplay of Jews and Poles and the interplay of Jewish and Polish culture is a lot more important than we believe today uh, because clearly after the Holocaust, we Jews didn't have a lot of good things to say. Yeah. Can you say anything about the content of popular Jewish culture during that period? Oh, oh yeah, I mean, can, can you say something about the content of popular Jewish culture? 
Uh, absolutely. Now, I've been involved in designing the interwar gallery in the museum. Yesterday I gave a talk about this. And uh, I mean, the, the first thing to understand about popular Jewish culture in the 20s and 30s, one, is that Jews didn't want to live in a cultural ghetto. So that even if you looked at the libraries uh, where most of the books checked out were in Yiddish rather than Polish, uh, most of the books that were checked out in Yiddish were still Yiddish translations of non-Jewish writers. Uh, Jews were great consumers of uh, film. They were great consumers of, of, of uh, dance, uh, popular music. Uh, a typical song in interwar Poland is about this religious Jewish girl who has a chnyok of a boyfriend who, who doesn't believe in mixed dancing. And she says, uh-uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, she says, Max to sein, wer du bist, da verbrennt der Zionist, da bin du wirst, wenn geht der Song, es kommen Listen, wenn er Zeit und Nächte, er tut er leid am Tanz und Tango und Charles Stone. Which means, I don't give a damn who you are, you can be a, uh, a Bundist, you could be a Zionist, I don't care, the time's going to come where even the guys in the Aguda are going to know how to do the Tango and the Charleston. Uh, <laughs> So there was a great interest in popular culture, a uh, great interest in, uh, in American movies. My uh, grandmother ran a restaurant in the middle of the shtetl, and on Saturday nights they would uh, move the chairs, and in the hall they'd show films for the Jews and Belarusians and Poles. And I found the ads that she put in the shtetl newspaper, King Kong, uh, Captain's Courageous, and my mother remembers that in the summer before the war, they were told that the next year they might get the Kishuk Macher from us, the Wizard of Oz, and that we can be going on with the wind. Uh, so, you know, not only that, but uh, Jewish culture in Poland before the war was not a zero sum game, as I tried to say say in my lecture, in other words, Jews could be Jewish, but at the same time consumers of non-Jewish cultures in different languages. They were very interested in Charles Lindbergh, despite his politics, but they were interested in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the flight across the ocean. They were very interested in, in uh, the Arctic uh, exploration of the 1930s. So it was a very it was this great yearning for being part of the world. Yeah. You mentioned that at the end of the 30s, most many Jews went to Polish schools. But if I remember correctly, there were a lot of cargo schools. Yeah. You didn't mention anything about them. How popular were they? Now, well, keep in mind, you know, I've been working on this museum for six or seven years now. We have a whole exhibit on the Tarbot schools. Yesterday in Stanford, I showed uh, PowerPoints of our exhibit on, on the Tarbot schools. Uh, so the Tarbot schools, or the, or the Hebrew schools uh, uh, supported by the Zionist movement, were very important, very inventive, very creative. The problem with the Tarbot schools and the Tzisho schools and uh, especially the uh, Sisho schools, which were secular Yiddish, the Tarbot schools, which were Hebrew, is that they depended on the tuition. My father went to a Tarbot school. And uh, as the economic situation of Polish Jewry became more difficult, especially with the Depression, more and more Polish Jewish parents felt forced to send their kids to Polish public schools because they were cheaper. Uh, the Tarbot schools stood out for their uh, uh, pedagogy, stood out for the excellence with which they taught the Hebrew language. And you see some of this in the Ringel Blue Marka, uh, that in the essays that children in the Warsaw Ghetto wrote who've been to the Tarbot schools, the Hebrew is very, very good. And I have postcards when I was a camper, when I was nine years old, my father would write me postcards in Hebrew. And because he went to a Polish Tarbot school, his Hebrew was very, very good. The Tarbot Gymnasium in Vilna graduated such people as Abba Kovner and Yitzhak Zuckerman, who later became great leaders of the Jewish resistance in World War II. So the Tarbot played a very important role, just as Polish Zionism, even though it was losing popularity in the 1930s, 
you know, still help the development of the Yishuv. The 100,000 Polish Jews who went to Palestine were indispensable in the eventual establishment of the State of Israel. But yeah, I mean, I'm, we're very aware of the Target schools, and if you go to the museum on the second floor uh, of the interwar exhibit, there's a whole nice exhibit about the Target schools. Yeah. Uh, I read your lecture about the Jews in Warsaw between between the wars, but this picture here is is very ironic because in some ways, in current day Poland, it is actually coming true to some extent. Yeah. Say something about that. I mean, there is sort of what I call like from the 1960s uh, with Native Americans and, 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 and European Americans finding that culture very attractive. Now, a lot of Poles are finding the, the not the, the lack of Jews and the lack of Jewish culture very attractive with the Jewish culture itself. Yeah, I mean, there's a that you know that that now that now there are very few Jews in Poland. Uh, Poles are finding. Jewish culture, very attractive. Yes, there's a Jewish culture festival uh, in, uh, in uh, Krakow. There's growing interest in uh, Jewish culture. Uh, some of it uh, is, uh, let's, let's put it this way. A lot, of, a lot of younger people are really interested in their country's past. And, they're, and as they realize that Poland was not always 99% Polish, but that Poland once upon a time was a multi-ethnic country and that the Jews were an important part of it. You know, there's this real interest in finding out about who the Jews were. When the building of the museum opened, 15,000 people visited in the first two days. So there is a lot of interest. So Sam, yeah. we don't want to wear you out. This okay. has been wonderful. So let's thank Sam. Also, Sam's lecture at, from Stanford yesterday will be on podcast on talbiphilanthropies.org soon. Yeah, great. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you.